Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Be seated. Be seated, please. Okay, I think you're all set. Oh, no. And I think that's Good afternoon. Uh, I am thrilled to welcome all of you here uh, to this conversation between Kenji Oshino, our Chief Justice Earl Warren, Professor of Constitutional Law, and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg. Thank you. Justice, welcome to NYU. Um, we are thrilled uh, to have you here. This event is being sponsored by our Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging, uh, which Kenji directs, and co-sponsored by our new Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network. Thank you, Sheila Birnbaum. as well as by Law Women and the Women of Color Collective. Um, now I'm gonna stop talking quickly because I'd like to think that I'm the reason you're all here, but I know better than that. Um, if ever there was a person in American life who needed no introduction, it's Justice Ginsburg. So I will not propose to give her a long one, but we are truly thrilled to have her here. Um, as you all know, she has been serving on the Supreme Court for this year, it will be 25 years. Um, President Clinton called her the Thurgood Marshal of the women's rights movement when he announced her nomination. Um, I'm not sure what that makes her now, except an icon and a role model and an inspiration to so many of us. I will say that that's certainly true for me personally as well. It was the great professional honor of my life to clerk for the justice now 15 years ago. Uh, and justice, a, a real thrill for me to welcome you to my law school. So without further ado, Kenji, I'll turn things over to you for what I'm sure will be a fascinating conversation. May I say only that Trevor was the kind of law clerk I wish I could have kept forever. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Trevor, uh, and thank you, Justice, for joining us today. I want to jump right in and say, Justice, you came to NYU Law in 1993 to deliver the 24th Madison Lecture. The author's note to the article that came out of that lecture has a wonderful author's note, which states, as this article went to press, the author was appointed Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. <laughs> and is, I'm glad you said 1993 because the issue of the NYU Law Review it appears in says 1992. So the Law Review was a little bit behind in getting out. <laughs> It's issued, but it was, in, it was indeed March of 1993. I did note the discrepancy. <laughs> it was wonderful to have you here with us at the beginning of your tenure as justice on the court. And I thought I'd begin by connecting the dots between some of the themes of your Madison lecture and contemporary events, specifically with a question around social movements. The article, which is titled Speaking in a Judicial Voice, famously characterized Roe versus Wade as having moved too far, too fast, not in striking down the draconian Texas law at issue in that case, but in creating too broad a formulation of the right to abortion. As we reflect on current social movements, from the struggle for marriage equality to the Me Too movement, can you speak broadly about when we know a legal movement is moving too fast and when it has found its time? Roe was the first abortion decision that the Supreme Court uh, heard. Uh, I'll take this opportunity to say, I don't like the comparison of me to Thurgood Marshall, because my life was never in danger. His was. He went to his southern town in the morning, 
he couldn't be sure he'd be alive at the end of the day. I never had that kind of threat. But he was a model for me in this respect. Many times Thurgood Marshall appeared before courts challenging separation of the races in schools. And he would say, separation, separate but equal, is not before the court today. He had building blocks till he get there. Think of Sweat Against Painter, when Texas finally became aware that it couldn't simply deny legal education to African Americans, wouldn't think of sending them to the University of Texas. Instead, it set up a separate, vastly inferior school. That was one. And then there was McLaurin, and then another involving, involving colleges. And one state said, we'll pay your tuition for you to go out of state, but we're not going to educate you at our state university. Another where um, the, the plaintiff was made to sit by himself in the back of the room. When Thurgood Marshall thought he had those building blocks in place, then in Brown v. Board, he said, now we can argue enforced separation can never be equal. That was what was missing uh, when Roe got to the court. The challenge was to the most extreme law in the nation. The only basis for an abortion was the woman's life, not her health, not that the, uh, she had been raped, or the victim of incest. It was only her life. I thought it was a great case to go first because it was easy to say, this is too extreme, period. And then wait for the next case, and the next case, and the next case. In fact, I was startled by what some of the next cases were. The Medicaid coverage of abortion Twice the Supreme Court rejected, rejected that. So and I know that there are many people who disagree with me in, uh, on this subject, but perhaps if the court had proceeded the way Marshall did with building blocks, we might not have had the result that we had in the Medicaid coverage of abortion decisions. I mean, since Roe v. Wade, the Supreme Court has limited, there's all been limitations, no extension of any right. We were speaking about this a bit upstairs, uh, thinking about Me Too, the LGBT rights movement, and abortion. And one of the things that struck me was that the power in the LGBT rights movement was a moment when everyone woke up and realized that they had a gay member of their extended family. And my hope is that the power of the Me Too movement is that everyone will wake up belatedly and understand that someone in their family whom they love has been a victim of sexual assault. But the cautionary note is that everybody in their extended family has somebody who has had an abortion. So what, in your view, distinguishes abortion from the more hopeful narrative that I think we can tell about the LGBT rights movement? I think uh, the LGBT movement was bound to succeed when People came out of the closet, came out of hiding, and said, this is who I am, and I'm proud of it. And you looked around, and there was your next door neighbor, of whom you were very fond, or your child's best friend, perhaps your child. There was never once people stood up and said, this is who I am, and I'm proud of it. It was never like uh, the racial divide in this country. It was no we, they. A, a gay person 
was in my family, was my schoolmate. They were part of we, and I think that that's what accounts in large measure for how successful the movement has become. And my own view of, of the abortion right, I think of what the situation is in the United States now. There is no woman in any state, no woman of means, who is ever threatened by not having access to an abortion. Take the worst case. Suppose Roe v. Wade is overruled. Who will be affected? There will be states that will continue to, to allow access to abortion. At the time of Roe, four states allowed abortion in the first trimester for any reason or no reason. New York, Hawaii, um, Alaska, and I think California. In, in any case, now there are many, many states that would not go back to the way it was. So if you're stuck in a state that doesn't give access, you move to a neighboring state for the procedure. That means the only women who are genuinely affected by restrictive abortion laws are poor women, and voiceless women, and that's a very sorry situation. So perhaps that makes us more sanguine about what will happen with the Me Too movement for the less than wonderful reason that high status women are also vulnerable to sexual assault in a way that they are not vulnerable to de-accessing de or lack of access to the abortion right. So. I would go, think back to in the early 70s. A publisher sent me a manuscript. It was Kitty McKinnon's book, Sexual Harassment in the Workplace. So this was in the early 70s. Titles haven't been on the books for a number of years. And she wrote that book and she said, sexual harassment is discrimination on the basis of sex within the meaning of Title VII. And then it was not too many years before the Supreme Court, before the Supreme Court agreed. Until then, uh, people, including women, thought, well, that's the way it is. I have to put up with it. Boys will be boys. So that, that book and the, the, the litigation that followed uh, was successful up to a point. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until this most recent movement when people came out in numbers, and it wasn't just one at a time curiosity. And the media were willing to pay attention to it. I do, do know that one of the um, people who came forward about Harvey Weinstein said she told her story to the Times two years ago, and they didn't pay any attention then. Mm -hmm. What sparked it now? And I think it, it's the there have been a number of noteworthy cases, and many women coming forward. We can even remember a man who might have been the Prime Minister of France who was brought, brought down because of his um, very bad behavior toward a, toward a maid in, in a hotel. Mm -hmm. So that was my concern at first, that this shouldn't just be the people in the headlines, the Hollywood stars, but it does seem to be getting through. Good. I want to move from speaking in a judicial voice to being interrupted when you speak in that voice. <laughs> a few months ago, there was an article in the Virginia Law Review that noted that 54% of interruptions 
during oral arguments at the Supreme Court were directed at the female justices. In a period of study in which women constituted on average only 22% of that court. It also observes that all four female justices, including you, across the course of their tenure, quote, learn to change their speech patterns, close quote, by, for example, omitting polite prefatory phrases like, may I ask? Does this ring true to you? And if so, did you consciously change the way you intervened during oral arguments over your time as a justice? And I, I would answer that with a strong no. In fact, I adopted the may I ask many years after I became a justice. It was from observing my colleague, John Paul Stevens, yeah. who asked very challenging questions, but he always began in such a gentle way. <laughs> may I ask? The only effort I, may, I make is to keep my questions as short as possible so I don't eat into counsel's time. Mm. But my first encounter with interruption was a headline in USA Today several years ago, and it was, Rude Ruth Interrupts Sandra. <laughs> One woman interrupting another. Uh, I asked a question and Sandra said, just a minute, I'm not finished. I apologized to her at lunch and she said, don't give it another thought, Ruth. The guys do it to each other all the time. <laughs> and as, so then I had met the reporter who, whose byline was under that story. And, <laughs> and I suggested that he do that. He, he should watch how often the men interrupt each other. And he, he came to me later and he said, you're right, they do. But I never noticed it when it was a man interrupting another man. Mm. There was an op-ed piece by a woman who was a linguist, and she was coming to my defense. She was going to explain this phenomenon. How come Ruth interrupted Sandra? <laughs> well, she said, Justice Ginsburg is a fast-talking Jew from New York. <laughs> Justice O'Connor is a girl of the Golden West, so laid back. Um, <laughs> now, anyone who knew the two of us would appreciate immediately that Sandra got out two words to my every one. <laughs> but it's another example of the stereotype. This time, it was very well intended. And I do think that, that article has gotten a lot of publicity, and let's see if it does affect my colleagues. I think it well may. Mm. I want to build on your reference to Justice O'Connor. Um, many scholars in the diversity and inclusion field have written about the importance of a critical mass. Of course, this comes up in the affirmative action cases as well. This is the idea that numerosity enables individuals to speak as individuals rather than remaining spokespeople for their group. Social psychologist Claude Steele has even applied this to the Supreme Court, saying that there was a downtick in the references to Justice O'Connor's feminist jurisprudence or the influence that the fact that she was a woman had in our opinions once you joined the court. You've had a very unique experience, however, um, because you joined the court when Justice O'Connor was there, and then there was a period from 2006 to 2009 when you were the sole woman on the court, and now you have two other female colleagues. So how has the number of female colleagues, if at all, changed your experience of being on the court? First, let me say that the worst period was when I was the lone woman, those few years when Sandra had left and before Justice Sotomayor was appointed. It was the public that came to observe the court 
not altogether the wrong impression. There were eight rather well-fed men, and then there was this, this little... <laughs> now, in the years that Sandra and I overlapped, invariably one lawyer or another would respond to my question, Justice O'Connor, and sometimes Sandra would say, I'm Justice O'Connor, she's Justice Ginsburg. That doesn't happen nowadays. You know, they, in the beginning, they knew there was a woman on the court. She'd been there all alone for 12 years. So they hear a woman's voice, so it must be Justice O'Connor. I am not confused with either Justice Sotomayor or Justice King, and I think we have reached a critical mass. And we're all over the bench. Because I've been there so long, I sit close to the middle. Sotomayor is to my left and Kagan to my right. And anyone who observes court proceedings will confirm that my uh, female colleagues are not shrinking violets. <laughs> they are very active in the colloquy that goes on. There was, in the years that Justice Scalia and Justice Sotomayor overlapped, I think it was a contest between the two of them who could ask the most question <laughs> at an oral argument. So three is uh, much better than one. People have asked me, when will there be enough? And my answer is, when there are nine. <laughs> then, <laughs> Now, why that idea should be so strange when, for most of the court's history, it has been nine men until 1981. Hmm. I believe there was a brief period of time when, by congressional statute, there were 10 justices on the court. So yeah. maybe you should aim higher. <laughs> 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 on that note, I actually want to speak about representation in the legal profession more broadly. So women have comprised approximately 50% of law school entering classes since 2001. Uh, last year at NYU, uh, the admission or the incoming class was 55% women. But if you look at the top of the legal profession, the representation of women remains stubbornly poor. Only 19% of equity partners at major law firms were women in 2017, which was only 3% higher than it was 10 years before that. Assuming a linear progression, we will not achieve gender parity in the big law equity partnership ranks until the year 2117. What is causing this rupture in the pipeline and what can we do as educators or members of the profession to change that dynamic? Instead of looking at the way it is, how about looking back to the way it was? There were no women partners. There were no women associates in most of the large law firms. <clears throat> in the ancient days when I entered law school, I was one of nine women in a class of over 500. It was pre-Title VII days, and employers had no hesitation about putting on sign-up sign sheets for interviews, men only. I don't know how many times I was told um, by a law firm, we had a woman once, and she was dreadful. <laughs> so how many men have you had? who didn't work out as you thought. And I started teaching law in 1963, and up till then, there had been, I think, 16 women in tenure track places on law faculties across the country. I had never had a woman teacher. Then think of the judiciary. President Carter 
did a wonderful thing. He was not a lawyer, but he had vacancies on federal courts to fill, never on the Supreme Court, but district courts and court of appeals. And he looked around at the composition of the federal judiciary and thought, they all look just like me. They're all white men. But that's not how the great United States is composed. So I want my judges be, to be drawn from all of the people, not just some of them. And he made a concerted effort to nominate members of minority groups and women in numbers and not as one-at-a-time curiosities. So when people ask me, did you always want to be a judge? My answer is I wanted a job in the law, <laughs> any job. <laughs> anyway, after getting the first job, the woman did it at least as well as the man, and so the next job was not that same hurdle, but getting your foot in the door surely, surely was. So my law school class had nine women. My daughter, who went to that same law school, by then it was 25%. And now my granddaughter, 50% in her class. So let's look at the positive, mm -hmm. positive things. And on the judiciary, well, I was one of the lucky 11 women that caught a point, appointed to Court of Appeals. And he had over 25, I think, appointed to district courts. And no president ever went back to the way it was when women were barely there on the federal bench. President Reagan didn't want to be outdone, so he was determined to put the first woman on the Supreme Court. And he made a great choice in Sandra Day O'Connor. So looking at, at law firms and remembering the way it was, first women couldn't be there at all, and then maybe they would be hired to work in the estates department. Now there are no entirely closed doors, and I think on the, the hiring level, um, it's just the, the women are hired in about the same numbers as men. Mm -hmm. It's just that they thin out as you go up the ladder in a firm. Mm -hmm. You recently expressed support for an Equal Rights Amendment uh, for women as a formal Article Five Amendment to the Constitution. I was wondering about both the upsides and the downsides there. Um, so I wonder what the Equal Rights Amendment would do in addition to the sex discrimination jurisprudence with intermediate scrutiny plus, you know, that you've developed over years as a judge. The, the phrase is exceedingly persuasive justification. You must have an exceedingly persuasive justification <laughs> for, for a gender-based classification. What do I think of the Equal Rights Amendment? I was a big advocate of the amendment in the days when it was alive. I am still an advocate for it. I'm sometimes asked, well, haven't, haven't the courts gone about as far in using the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment or the Equal Protection Clause that isn't there but is implicit in the Fifth Amendment? And my answer is, is, so if I take out my pocket constitution, which I carry with me wherever I go in the world, <laughs> so here it is. And I want to show it to my granddaughters. I want them to see what are the fundamental tenets of our society. And I can look at the First Amendment, free speech, free press, but there's nothing, there's no statement in this Constitution that men and women are people of equal citizenship stature. Mm. 
every constitution in the world written since the year 1950 has an Equal Rights Amendment. Even countries that honor it in the breach, but they have it listed among fundamental human rights. So I would like to see in this, our Constitution, that simple statement. Mm -hmm. I think it's great that we've advanced as far as we have using the Equal Protection Clause. But we can't escape what the history was. When the 14th Amendment was uh, in the hopper, it was the first big break between the abolitionist movement and the feminist movement. The feminist movement around the time of the Civil War were some of the most prominent abolitionists. But then the 14th Amendment, second section, introduces into the Constitution for the very first time the word male. And so Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton opposed the 14th Amendment because it left them out. Mm -hmm. uh, still, we have a constitution with broad principles that are properly interpreted in tune with the times in which we live. And so due process and equal protection may have gotten us almost as far as an explicit statement of the equal citizenship stature of men and women. But as I said, it belongs in our constitution. It should be a fundamental tenet of our society. Mm -hmm. And there is some interest in Congress in reviving it. Uh, I would be very much in favor of that endeavor. I uh, actually teach the exceedingly persuasive justification language from United States versus Virginia in my con law class, and I can't resist getting a little bit into the weeds here because I believe the formal standard for intermediate scrutiny traditionally has been substantially related to an important governmental right. interest. Yeah. And in Virginia, you inserted that it, in your majority opinion for the court, you said that the justification had to be an exceedingly persuasive justification. And Chief Justice Rehnquist in his concurrence said, you're taking a description of a test that was articulated in Feeney, because the quotation was from the Feeney case, and you're making it an element of the test, thereby making the test harder. So could I ask you whether? Well, well I had more than Feeney. Feeney, as you know, was, went the wrong way in my view. It was a, a, a case challenging the absolute preference for men in Massachusetts civil service law. In most states, there was a points added system. So you got 15 points added if you were a veteran. Massachusetts, you go to the top of the list. You suppose you get 65, a bare pass. Uh, you bump a woman who's gotten 99 on the test. Why did it work out that way? Because there was such a restrictive quota for women in the military. Um, the, the, the Supreme Court upheld the, the Massachusetts absolute veterans preference. But the, the same phrase was used by Thurgood Marshall in a case called Kirchberg against Feenstra. That was the case that it lasted in, in to the Louisiana, the civil law, head and master rule. That is, uh, husband and wife are co-owners of all of the property that comes in during the marriage. But the husband is the head and master of the community, and he so he can do what he wants with that joint property. And it was finally in 1982, I think, Kirchberg was, that uh, Marshall used the exceedingly persuasive justification language mm -hmm. in striking down mm -hmm. um, the head and master rule. Mm -hmm. The civil law rule, but the common law is no better. It was husband and wife on one, but the one is the husband. 
I want to return to the Equal Rights Amendment and to say that I actually entirely agree with you that there's a really important norm enunciative aspect to having text that recognizes the equality of women in the Constitution. I think my fear, and I hope you can allay this for me, Justice Ginsburg, is that if we have an Equal Rights Amendment for women, then there's a danger that the Equal Protection Clause could be interpreted more narrowly, as your colleague, the late Justice Scalia, used to say, right, the Equal Protection Clause is about race. If you want it to extend beyond race, then pass a constitutional amendment. I think we have too many decisions already um, interpreting the Equal Protection Clause as it should be for our society. Uh, what was the case? Um, the housing for the um, mentally... The Cleburne case in 1985? Yes, yes. And there have been a number, a number of cases y using the Equal Protection Clause uh, to assure that government treats people fairly and doesn't discriminate against them just because of who they are. So I don't think, there's too much law now, I think, too many precedents. Mm -hmm for the court to backslide mm -hmm. Great. on that. I was wondering, I can't help saying, uh, hearing the mirth from the audience, I was wondering whether a Yoshino can deliver a Ginsburn or not. <laughs> <laughs> I want to move to your relationship with the late Justice Scalia. Uh, your friendship with him is widely cited as an exemplar of how individuals can maintain close friendships across the political divide. But political polarization in this country is getting worse, and people seem to be retreating more, not less, into their own ideological bubbles, and feeling more, not less, hostile toward their political opponents. What advice do you have for how to maintain a friendship or a professional relationship, even when you profoundly disagree with a person on such fundamental subjects? Uh, one important consideration is the good and welfare of the institution for which you work. The Supreme Court is the most collegial place I've ever been, beyond any law faculty, beyond the, the DC Circuit where they were collegial. It's because we all revere this Constitution and the US judiciary and we don't want to tarnish it. That's something that pulls us together. And with Justice Scalia, it's more than that. I knew him since the days when we were both law teachers. Mm. And the first time I heard him speak was at an American Bar Association event in DC. He was talking about uh, some administrative law topic I disagreed with a lot of what he was saying, but I was captivated by the way he said it because he was so charming and so funny. In the years we were together on the DC circuit, he would sometimes turn to me and he'd tell a joke that would just crack me up. <laughs> <laughs> and I had all I could do to control myself and not burst out into hilarious laughter. Uh, something else that we shared, well, we shared a sort of a common upbringing. He grew up in Queens, I grew up in Brooklyn. We both care about family. And we used to have an annual New Year's party where my children came and whichever of the Scalia nine children I felt like <laughs> coming. And something else that we shared, we both loved opera, and Justice Scalia and I were super uh, extras, supernumeraries, twice in the Washington Opera. <laughs> the, uh, there is even an opera, and the opera is called Scalia Ginsburg. <laughs> uh, it is, of course, a comic 
opera. <laughs> and the plot is roughly based on Mozart's The Magic Flute. Uh, Justice Scalia is locked in a dark room. He is being punished for excessive dissenting. <laughs> and I come to his rescue. I enter through a glass ceiling. <laughs> and then the, the man who's in charge of the tests, he's le a character left over from Mozart's Don Giovanni. They call him in Scalia Ginsburg the commentatore. He asks, why would you want to help him? He's your enemy. And I explain that he is not my enemy, he's my friend, and we sing a duet. <laughs> but before I describe the duet, this, this is a, a brilliant composer, librettist, lawyer. A, a young man named Derek Wang, he has uh, music degrees from Harvard and Yale, and then decided that in his business, it would help to learn a little bit about the law. So he enrolled in his local law school, the University of Maryland. And in his second year, he's taking a constitutional law class. He comes across these dueling opinions, Scalia on one side, Ginsburg on the other, and decides this could make a very funny opera. <laughs> if you're interested in the Columbia Journal of Law and Arts, the entire libretto with footnotes, at least as many footnotes as law review articles contain, <laughs> But it starts out with Scalia's rage aria. And this is an aria that's very Handelian in style. And it goes like this. The justices are blind. How can they possibly spout this? The Constitution says absolutely nothing about this. <laughs> And then I answer in my lyric soprano voice, telling him that he is seeking bright line solutions to problems that don't have easy answers. But the great thing about our Constitution is that, like our society, it can evolve. And then there's sort of a jazzy part, let it grow. <laughs> but then, it, when I come to his aid, we sing a duet that goes, we are different, we are one. Different in our approach to legal texts, but one in our reverence for the institution we serve. One bright sign in a not very bright time is the House and Senate Judiciary Committees and their staffs asked to have excerpts from Scalia Ginsburg. And this was in November in the Library of Congress. We did these excerpts. Uh, Senator Hatch was there. Senator Grassley was there. What will come of it? remains to be seen, but Senator Grassley did ask me for a copy of my remarks at that, on that occasion. Another thing about our relationship, I could be very frank with him. I could say, this opinion is so over the top, you would be more persuasive if you turn, toned it down. Well, I'd say he never listened to that. <laughs> on the other hand, Scalia was a great grammarian. His father taught Latin at Brooklyn College, and his mother was, was a grade school teacher. So he would sometimes either call me or come into chambers and say, Ruth, you made, you made a grammatical slip. <laughs> he would not embarrass me by sending a, a, a memo that would go to all of my colleagues. But, so that was the, the kind of relationship that that we, we had. We looked critically at each other's opinion, even when we were on opposite sides. Great. 
Well, this has been a visit perfect in being much too short, as Jane Austen says. Um, I want to close this conversation by thanking our co-sponsors, Law Women, the Women of Color Collective, and the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network. I'd also like to thank the many individuals who worked tirelessly to make this event possible. I'd particularly like to thank Claire Whitman, sitting there in the front row of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network, and Shirley Dang of the Center for Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And I'd also like to thank teams from the Dean's Office and Hospitality. And before I close with the Justice, I'd like to ask everyone in the room to remain seated, both here in Tishman and in the overflow rooms, while the Justice makes her exit into the lobby. So please wait for us to sound the all clear. So finally, I'd like to thank you, Justice Ginsburg. Um, John Marshall once said of the founders that no tribute could be made to them that could exceed their merit. As an advocate, scholar, judge, and justice, you've made a myriad contributions to show us what it is like to live greatly in the law. But the legacy we celebrate today is that you are the founder of new norms of gender equality in the court and throughout the nation. So to borrow from Justice Marshall from McCulloch versus Maryland, I would like to say to you, no tribute can be made to you which exceeds your merit. Please join me in thanking Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg.